Thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just Go Play podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Devonish, also known as Coach D. I'm here with my guest host, Matt Young. And today I'm excited to say we got a great guest on here today. We have Eric McLaughlin, uh, who works with the Coaches Association of Ontario. Um, and we're going to get down and get dirty and talk about coaching. Eric, thank you for being on today. Thank you for being here today. Um, for our audience, just give us a little bit of your backstory and, and why you are where you are today in this position to talk about this coaching and and what's going on in the landscape and whatnot we're, we're going to get to that but just give us a little bit of your backstory so people understand why you are here today well thanks so much for having me daryl and matt it is a, a true privilege and an honor to be here and you know talk about my favorite subject coaching and sports uh and so i mean your podcast has has been uh something i've listened to and so i'm super excited to to be on here and and share what i can and m- my background you know i was a i was a swimmer growing up as a kid played baseball played soccer um and then i got into coaching around 16 17 years old and i coached uh, swimming for about 10 years uh, in various cities uh i did an undergrad at laurentian university in psychology and sports psychology um, I originally wanted to be a sports psychologist, uh, and then I realized it was a lot of work and PhDs, and I didn't do so well with the school. I, I, my home was on the pool deck, and you know, working with kids and working with athletes, predominantly from like eight to eighteen, and uh, from there uh, it ballooned to um, you know coming back home to Brampton, where I was living getting another coaching job there in my sport of swimming. And then it sort of evolved years after that to um, where I am today for the past four years with the Coaches Association of Ontario, uh, you know, leading our events and partnerships uh, and sort of navigating the coaching system for our province of Ontario. And, you know, we've got about 150,000 coaches in the province of Ontario that our organization supports uh, and looks to educate and work towards a better system for sport and a better system for coaches. And every day I love my job because it's something new. Yeah. I just want to jump in there, Eric, because I, we've had the pleasure of actually being at one of your events. And I will say the whole process was, was one to be modeled by other people, in my opinion, my humble opinion for what it's worth, you know, the, the effort um, to tie into a central theme the, the lengths that you go to to make sure the right people are in the room, that it's engaging, that there's a takeaway, that it's not just coming in and slamming information out, that there's a, 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 uh, an opportunity for interaction because that's really where the, where the, the questions are answered and the gains are to be had. So, so a hat tip for you for that. I want to go back to one thing that you said, and, and, and Wade Gilbert said the same thing, and we had a great opportunity to talk to him a couple podcasts ago about the difference between the academic and the, let's call it street smarts. And what you said, uh, what really struck me, you know, PhD, um, you know, psychology, masters, getting that delineation, but your home was on the pool deck. And that's what you said in your coach since you're 16 years old. You know, we, we often hear that, like this, this coach has a, an IQ versus an EQ. Can you talk to us a little bit about that to start off this whole podcast? Because a lot of coaches will say, you know, I don't really have the time or inclination to go to the lengths to get my PhD, this, 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 but I love kids. I'm good with kids. And I really have that uh, connection. Can you talk about that a little bit in terms of it's important and it's important to coaching and maybe your experience? For sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, first I'll say, you know, you don't need a PhD or a master's degree or anything fancy to be a coach. And one of the things that's a a common misconception for a lot of people is, um, you know, coaching, you know, it, it requires these advanced knowledges of sports science and all of these things. And for most people, 90% of sport doesn't happen at that level. It's not happening at the high performance level and, you know, the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games and the Pan Am Games and those levels. 75% of coaches in our province are volunteer. 
And that means they're doing so not paid, which means they probably also have a kid in their sport, which is the most reasons why people take up coaching. Is their kid, niece, nephew, something along those lines. And um, when, I was, when I was a young athlete, I was spearheaded into coaching because I had a great coach. And the experience that I had, um, positive that it was, led me to wanting to make that difference and give back to my sport. I had a really bad injury when I was a teenager just because, you know, I, I just did. I suffered a big elbow injury and I couldn't really do it anymore. I, I still was doing it, but not at the level I wanted to. And I wanted to make that transition to, to giving back. And I love the sport of swimming. I love sport in general. And, you know, I knew some, I felt like I knew something, but not until I got into coaching. Then I was like, oh, there's so much more here that I knew the sport uh, and I knew some things in there. But then I took my time to go get educated, reading those books and things that you can find from Wade Gilbert and Human Kinetics and things online and through the NCCP and all those coaching programs that do exist as that base foundation of knowledge for me was about you know, that's where I want to be. And then it evolved to, um, you, you know, you don't need extra science and extra degrees to coach eight or 12 year olds or 16 year olds. They're ultimately in there for one reason, and that's to have fun. Yeah, fantastic. Great. So good. I really, like, really like what you said about, you know, you don't need the, the PhD in academics to, to coach. Really, it's a passion for coaching. And another thing that I like is, the saying is you coach the way you were coached. And it's so great to hear a great experience because we often hear the other side of it where you had the old school coach who yelled and so you're a yeller and that's all you know. And it's not coming from any bad intent. It's just coming from that experience of coaching the way you're coached. So it's so great to hear you had a fantastic experience like many do. And, and, but then not only did you have a fantastic experience, you took that up and you decided to carry the baton forward. Um, into your into your vocation, so that's fantastic. One, I have one more thing I want to sneak in, and I always get accused. Daryl's like, "Matt, shut up!" Just so I can have a couple talks. Give me one. Give me one. <laughs> so, so Eric, I want to talk about our sports system, okay? And I want to compare it to our neighbors from the south, okay? So, the United States, United States, USOPC is a, at the top of the food chain, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, then we've got the national governing bodies and NGB. Uh, then we have the uh, NCAA, so that's uh, all the school sports. Then we've got the AAU, and then we've got underneath the AAU, the local community sport organizations. That's the hierarchy or pyramid, if you will, for the United States, 350 million people, okay? Um, so my question is, uh, and bear with me here, now we go to Canada, 35 million people. Canadian Olympic Committee, Sport Canada, Athletes Canada on the podium. CSI regional. Uh, these are all high performance. Then we have the national sport organizations, Hockey Canada, uh, Basketball Canada, etc. Then we've got the national arms length government body sport for life, PHE Canada. Then we've got the provincial sport organizations, Sport Manitoba, Sport Alberta, BC Sport, Via Sport. Um, then we've got the provincial distribution. So in Alberta, you've got the um, Alberta sport, the five regions or six regions in BC, you've got the Pacific sports, they've got six regions. Then you've got the provincial sport organizations, which are BC hockey, BC tennis. Then you've got regional distributions and governance and oversight like the PCHL, which is not the provincial sport organization, but it's actually a regional governing body of hockey. Then you've got, of course, the academies. Then you've got the community um, in North Vancouver minor, North Vancouver soccer, North Vancouver this. Then you've got the elementary BC school of sports. So for a, a country that has a population significantly less of our counterparts in the United States, we have five times the, the I don't know what the great word is, layers. Uh, layers, tiers of sport management. In your opinion, is that a help? And I didn't even put in Coaching Association of Canada or anything to do with coaching. Those are just the tiers of the governance which makes it really tough to have an organizational alignment of any kind in, in sport because nobody's in charge, uh, very little accountability, and nobody has actually created an operations manual for the grassroots uh, development of sport. Everyone's trying to maintain their budget uh, and paycheck so they're relevant and we're, that, that usually lends itself to competition within that sport tier, which if you look at the ethos of sport is ironic to say the least, is there an opportunity to pare down sport? Do we have too much? Um, can it be better? Your opinion. 
Funny, and for those for keeping at home, uh, I'm not sure how many layers that was, actually. I lost track after about 10. 21. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, you've identified, uh, you know, something in sport that is unique to Canada. I'm not privy to some of the other countries in Scandinavia or things like that. Uh, but we know that, you know, a lot of sport does look to them. Uh, for some of those other differences uh, to our partners to the south and, and across the ponds and things like that. I think what you've identified, and I, I, I always hear you say this, is, you know, there's not a central person who's like an inspector or a person who's approving um, every system. Everyone has different roles and responsibilities. Do I think that that's the right way to go? I'm not sure, to be quite frankly honest. Um, I will say this is when we all forget about sometimes is who our consumer is, you know, Amazon and Google, all of those people know who their client, who's buying, they know everything about them, whether or not we like it or not, they know everything about us. And, you know, do, does every sport organization out there, local, provincial, high performance, you know, I think we always need to be reminded of who our client is. It's kids, right? It's the under 18 crowd. It's the volunteer parent and the volunteer coaches. And what is best for them? What are they asking for? And the two things that we pride ourselves on at Coaches Ontario and something that I personally work really hard on is access and affordability for things, for programs, for initiatives, because we know that those are the two biggest issues for people that we can control um, and have that positive impact to at least alleviate some of those uh, hierarchical differences that you mentioned. Uh, you know, I really do wish there was um, in my own opinion, when I was, you know, growing up in coaching, um, getting my certifications and everything like that, I actually only ever knew my sport existed. I didn't even know that other sports existed. I didn't even know that other organizations existed. Um, and you also said that there's competition for dollars. And, and so ultimately, whoever is giving those amount of dollars should reflect on what is the best way to you know, help that our client. What is our client asking for? What is What are those kids asking for? What are the parents asking for? And then how do we spend this pot of money in the best way forward to help them? I don't think it's about protecting jobs. Uh, I think, you know, jobs are important, but I just think as, a, as leaders in the space, tough decisions need to be made sometimes. And I think it's important that we don't forget about who we're actually in this for. And that's the kids ultimately. And if data goes to show us less kids are participating, who knows what the pandemic is going to do to that and less kids are, less coaches are participating as well. And so those should always be the first two things on everyone's agenda every single day. Right. Wow. So, well said. Really well said. Um, Eric. So based on Matt's question, I'm going to start there. What What is the role of the Coaches Association of Ontario? What is what is the role there? Of, what's their main role? So our role really is, um, it's twofold, really. Um, in the beginning days, uh, the organization has been around since 2002, if I believe I'm correct. Um, and really, its first role is delivering um, the National Coaching Certification Program uh, components of courses to coaches in our province. So our organization exists in every province, just named differently. Matt mentioned Alberta Sport Connection. That's like the, the counterpart in that province. And so that's always the first and foremost part is you every, each of us have a delivery aspect to coach education and delivering the important courses, things like safety, things like basic mental skills, nutrition, those basic things that coaches are gonna need along the way. The second piece that really, you know, for us that elevates Coaches Ontario, I think is supporting each of those 150,000 coaches. So how do we do that? We have great partners, uh, you know, in the Ontario government and the ministry there that are great funding partners to provide bursaries for courses for pro mentorship programs, uh, for grants for those provincial sport bodies to plan programs and initiatives, as well as that ongoing professional development of coaches. I think one of the things that people often forget about is uh, coaching is not one and done. It's not, I took my course, I'm done. I don't need to learn anything ever again. 
And just like teachers, they have to constantly renew their license and their ongoing education. Coaches need that too. They're, they're, and so there is a system where coaches have to maintain their professional development. And how do we do that? We offer free webinars. We offer conferences and workshops like Matt had attended and we've had the privilege of having him. And it's just improving the access and affordability to education and support for coaches. That's our role. Are, are these used well? Are like these uh, things that you offer, like the webinars, are, are they well attended? Yeah, so I, we actually just had a webinar uh, last week uh, on emotional intelligence. Um, you know, we go out and find different people who aren't the same in the system. So Matt is a perfect example of someone who came to one of our conferences. Um, you know, he's, he's not, you know, on the circuit and a random voice that people are used to hearing. And that's something that uh, we take great privilege in and, and pride in is finding people with a unique voice that are not necessarily someone someone are used to hearing from. Because just like when you're a kid in school, right? How many times have we heard the same thing over and over again from a teacher or a coach, but not until someone else says it in a different way, do you then understand it? Uh, and, and so um, on our last webinar, we're averaging three to 400 people per webinar all across the country. Um, majority is obviously from Ontario because that's where we advertise and work. But if someone from across the country wants to come in and listen, of course, we're not gonna say no. Um, but uh, we run them every month now on different assortment of topics. The key thing is though, is they're free. Well, that's good to know. I don't think people, like how do people find out about these things though? That's, you know, when, where are you guys marketing this? Because I think there's a lot of people that are missing out if this, especially if this is free. Yeah. And I mean, well, the one thing that you all both pointed out is all those different hierarchical levels can make marketing very difficult. But as a business, we also have to think about our organization still as businesses and we're marketing appropriately. You know, you don't need a marketing degree to understand what marketing 101 is and, and how to appropriately channel the message, how to reach the message. And, you know, one of the things we do for our present for, for our presenters and topics is it's not just you know us coming up with random topics. These are people telling us what they want to hear about. So they're not your standard topics, right? You know, we don't want to do the tried and true topics that are already done. We want to do things that people don't quite learn about in courses, things that you need to know. And we market them, you know, through social media. They can join our, our email list for free on our website. Uh, they can follow us you know, at Coaches Ontario. Um, and that's how you find out about sort of the next free webinar, discounted courses that are coming up. Um, that's the best way to get in touch with us. Yeah, hey, great, listen, great point. I want to jump in there because Daryl and I come from, you know, two decades of personal trainings. So intuitively, we've had to learn how to coach people. Um, not only the clients that we train, but also the new young people that were coming in to be trainers, uh, you know, and then got into the sport world. So coach, so transferred a lot of that um, experience over to the, the playing time. And, and what we both saw was a significant gap in coaches actually understanding the soft skills of coaching. Yes, we have the long-term athlete development uh, packages that have been fair, very good, well done. But mostly if, if the focus is on anything other than the standing, the score, and the schedule as a marker of success, it tends to be the technical, tactical, and physical development, uh, and not the things like competence, character, connection, and culture, which, which as you know, Eric, you've heard me say a lot, is really, like you talked about it at the, at the top of this show, it was really 98% of people, this, this is what it's about. It's a dress rehearsal in real life. We heard it from Wade Gilbert. We heard it from Gene Smith. We heard it from, we've heard it from everybody. So nobody disagrees, but at the same time, it doesn't seem like in our coach education, we've allocated a lot of time to those and how to nurture those things. Can you talk about that a little bit and some of the stuff that you've been doing? Because it sounds like when you're talking about emotional intelligence and that stuff, you're getting into those things because people are actually saying, hey, listen, I got the technical tactical stuff. I can tell someone to run from this cone to that cone all day long. But I, I had a young man or woman have a, have a bring a, crappy experience that they've had in their lives. And I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know how to read them. You know, I was hammering on them when, when, when they're being hammered on at home. Can you talk a little bit about that, Eric, in terms of what you see as the opportunity for the evolution of coaching going forward? Yeah, good point. I, you know, one of the things I always, I always hear from coaches and even from experts like yourselves and other speakers and presenters is, 
you can't take a course on everything. And, and so you only have so much time and energy. And, you know, especially when we're thinking about volunteer coaches, which means they already have limited time, access and money to do things, you know, what is on their plate already? And what are we asking them to do right now? Well, if we're already asking them to do five different things all out of their pocket or a majority of it out of their pocket, and then we throw in 10 other things that we think are important, not only is that, that's not a reason for me to continue coaching. Like I don't have time to keep doing this. And so that's one of the things that I think about a lot is, you know, the way that not only the system is, but the information that we're teaching people, you know, what can we do as an organization? What can we do as a system to prioritize Mm -hmm. what is the most important? And, but I also think that's tied to, and I've heard in some of your other podcasts and you know, this as well is money and where the dollars are flowing and what is being measured, you know? And so, I mean, the one thing I always say is how many clubs out there do you know of? I don't know too many that do an exit survey of their coaches. Probably not too many. Right. You're right. And, you know, we, you know, organizations, we should, we all know what, what assume means, right? And so if you assume something, it means you're not actually understanding what's happening. And I don't need to repeat the acronym about that one, but, um, you know, and I just think data is also our best friend, right? And, and I don't know if, if there actually is enough data out there to drive decisions and to make decisions and make the uh, show organizations that change needs to be made. You know, we're in a pandemic right now. I think this is a great time to reinvigorate ourselves as a system. Couldn't agree more. Build it back better. Yeah. Quick question on that. Who, who's responsible for uh, uh, changing or updating the curriculum? Who, is it a team of coaches or a team of academics? Who's responsible for that? Like on what, what we should be coaching coaches, where they should be focused, what, like, and when they, when this coaching curriculum should change. So I'll first start and say that I think one of the things for me personally, that I think sport does pretty poorly is we all operate in silos. And that also leads into your question of, well, who's responsible for what? The answer is, well, a lot of people. Um, and, and so, I mean, that's a pretty wishy-washy answer, but uh, it's because, you know, there are different people doing different things at different times for their different group. There's a lot of words that were different, but, mm-hmm. um, but that gives you an example of, you know, what someone is learning in one sport versus another sport. It's not the same. And the real question that I always ask is why not? Why, why do we allow organizations to operate as silos? Why, you know, where is the oversight in that to say, you know what, no, as the base knowledge of whoever I am, whether it's, you know, top of the line head honchos saying every sport organization, you must have X, Y, and Z. You don't get a choice anymore of what it is. You must have these pieces. Beyond that, then you can start learning X's and O's of, you know, kicking the ball, dribbling the ball, swimming and stuff like that. Because all that's important. It all is very, very important. But for most coaches, you know, if you're thinking about kids again, which is what we're supposed to be thinking about, they don't need to really know those things. It's about emotional intelligence, building competence, building competence in our kids, you know, showing them how to be able to do skills physically, how to run, throw, kick, jump, all of those things. And, and so long-winded answer, that there's a lot of people involved. <laughs> you're speaking our language though. But, but that, 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 that's what I'm curious about is so, you know this, and Matt and myself are, are, are trying to get the answer to this because we know it needs to change and it, it, it needs to be better. And, and you just said it. We might be focused on the wrong thing in our curriculum. And, and what do we do? Or, or, you know, how do we enforce it? Like you said, you're about accountability. How do we keep these guys accountable to not focus just on the X's and O's and start focusing on the other things like confidence competence, character, all that thing. So all these great things that we, we know produce quality sports experiences. How do we get these guys to do that? And I, I don't know if, I know you don't have the answer, but what, I wish I did. Yeah. yeah well, if, if, if you want to jump in, if you want to jump in on that. 
yeah, it's really interesting because both of you guys are have brought up a good point. And I look to the babysitting course, like you cannot babysit unless you have this course in babysitting and it's standard and that's just what you do. And kids do it when they're, gosh, what is it? 12, 13, 14, or I don't know what the age is, but it's really early. They take the course and then they can go out and make money. But we don't have that at the volunteer level of coaching. It's like, who's got the strongest heartbeat? Okay, now you're on the field. Did you do your background check? Okay, perfect. The background check's safe, and then you're you're on, you're on the pitch. So I, I think it's a societal um, uh, opportunity, a gap, hence opportunity. With every gap, there's an opportunity to say, listen, if we're going to be this stringent on who takes care of our kids in a babysitting course, first aid, all the things that they need to know. Why isn't this transferring over to the coaching courses? Why aren't we more concerned about the quality of people and individual in the training coming in to oversee from five to, to 75 kids for a, a prolonged period of time for, for, for months? And, and that's something that I've always wondered and, and just never really understood why, why there's not a better job in that. So I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer. I agree with you guys. The one thing that we're working on um, Eric, is we're working on creating a five course online module that really sits between Nike and US OPC's, you know, how to coach kids two minute video and between the, the CAC, you got to come, you got to get your coaching locker, you got to sit, you got to read the book, you got to do this, which is a really heavily invested for appropriately for those coaches that are kind of um, working their way up the level. So I'm not, I'm not bashing that, but there seems to be nothing in the middle for the, that addresses the EQ. Listen, why do kids want to play? What do they value? What do parents value? How do you communicate with the parents? How do you communicate with the kids? How do you set up practices? What should they be like? What's the theme, the sub theme? How do you, you know, what, how much time are you taking to allocate to practice prep? How much are you taking time taking to allocate practice debrief? How are you communicating that, what we practice to the kids so that they take some responsibility to it? So that's one of the things that we've started working on because quite, quite frankly, we just saw that there's a gap there and it's not there. Now it doesn't solve the question of who's enforcing that because ultimately um, nobody's, it's, it's just not the Canadian way to enforce that. Um, we would rather, we would rather see the participation rates plummet and, and go to rock bottom before we actually held somebody accountable to a higher uh, elevating their level of, of uh, expertise. Well, you mentioned, so, two things there that I just want to jump in on. So you mentioned the babysitting course. So perfect example. That's like a really good example. I will say, you know, I think sport, I, th I think sometimes it moves too slow. And um, I'll give you an example. So the babysitting course, you could parlay into an example like concussions. So in sport, I think sport has done a good job of here's a free concussion course. Everybody takes the base course. Here's signs, symptoms, what to do when. And I think we've all done a very good job of, of moving the needle uh, on that. But that's only one tiny little subject. And there's so much more to sport that, and if it's taken this long to do that topic, how long is it going to take to do the rest of them? Right. And so I think, you know, if I've heard you say this a million times, if there was a CEO of sport or your CEO of these organizations, you're, you're, you're fired and hired based on your metrics. Well, what are they? And chances are you'd probably be fired because what are those metrics that we're measuring? If it's sport participation and coach participation, then, you know, all those numbers are declining. So what's your answer to that? You know, exactly. Amazon and all those big companies, they make changes really quick to the, to, you know, they're losing, you know, you know, market share or consumer faith or consumer competence. They make quick changes. So why can't we as a system make those quick changes as well? And then secondly, you mentioned, you know, accountability and things. And, um, you know, I, one layer, I'll add another layer in there. I'll add to your long 21 list is also municipalities. And so, you know, I've heard on one of your other podcasts mention, you know, <laughs> coaching courses and education and your organization tied to like insurance pieces mm -hmm. and getting discounts and insurance. If your organization has X, Y, Z, well, you taught me this as well. When you came to our conference one time was um, what if the ministry, most of the time clubs and organizations are renting facility space from the municipality. 
you know, is there capacity or, or why can't, you know, the municipality, just like they have food inspectors, why can't we have, you know, some sort of little inspector in a perfect world, you know, inspector that goes around and says, you don't have all of these things in place. Your coaches don't have these things. You don't have these things as an organization. You don't get this field time. You can have it at midnight now because that's the only time we got available. And also it's five times the price. Right. Yeah, exactly. No, I totally agree. And and it's such a good point. And again, that's an accountability piece. We could talk for hours on this and the lack of, because that, that's a huge gap, which again is a huge opportunity. But let's go back to the metrics because you raise a really good point, Eric. And the only metrics in our opinion that need to be measured in sports are attract, retain, and growth metrics. And that goes across athletes, parents, coaches, officials, administrators. If, if you ask nine out of 10 clubs or sport organizations to, to provide their attract or tame growth metrics to you. They can't do it because they don't take them. And, and you know, earlier in, in the podcast, you talked about sport being a business. As, as a matter of fact, you said the business of sport. Couldn't agree more. Anytime there's a transaction and you're paying for a service, that's called a business. And, and I couldn't agree with you more that we have lost who the business is to serve and it's to serve the consumer. So if you get into the business of sport, and you, you think every parent's an idiot because they're yelling and they're emotional about their kids, well, then you shouldn't be running the sport because that's what sport is. It is emotion. It, and parents are going to get emotional. And if you can't, don't have the tools or you haven't educated yourself to be prepared to deal with that, which is called behavior change, um, which, which was why at the beginning of the podcast, when you said your psychology degree, I, I liked and why you are such a, a, an approachable, disarming solution based person like don't get me wrong i've seen you go no and draw the line when you needed to draw the line but that that's that's situational coaching and that's great coaching and we've heard that from you know we heard that from gene smith we heard that from michael donald from the pga we heard every, everything you're saying is consistent um but as you also pointed out in canada we're consistently inconsistent with its implementation uh, you know that's the thing we can hang our hats on we do all this great work and then it sits in the shelves in the PDFs and we don't actually, we're not, we, there's not a consistent method of, of doing it. And I think that has to do something with the hierarchy when you see the 21 different sport organizations and you ask someone what you'll hear and what we've heard, well, that's not my job. That's their job. That's, that's uh, coaching associations of Canada's responsibility. No, it's not actually. It's the municipality's responsibility. It's your association's responsibility. Coaching association Canada and, and Ontario coach association, their responsibility is to, provide the education for you, provide those opportunities to learn, but we can't, you know, force the horse to the, you can't force it to drink. We can lead it to the water. We can't force it to drink. So who is going to be that force to drink? And, and I think you're right. I think it has to be in the pocketbooks because I think that's really the only thing that people understand to make behavior changes is the fines in the pocketbooks. And when you look at some of the other countries and what they do, like Iceland, great article lately, you know, why is it, why are they punching so far above their weight? Well, it's a privilege and an honor to have the badge and certification for to coach the sport of football slash soccer in Iceland. It's a privilege. So that's the carrot. If you do that, you are, you are put on a pedestal, you got your own little site, you're this is this, you're promoted, all the whole nine yards. But the stick is someone goes around and if you haven't updated or done anything, you're out, you're off, you're not doing it. It's you're, you're fine. The club is fine. Every like, so, so they have both. They've got both the carrot and the stick. We tend to put out carrots all over the place in Canada because that's our nature, but there's no accountability. So it makes everything option. So anything in the absence of accountability is optional, as you know, as it all over. Mm -hmm. So at some point, somebody in that hierarchy of 21 plus 25, institutions has to say look at we need to take a bold step we, and, and like you said eric we need to build it back better because the way we were doing it before the pandemic the numbers weren't lying the the participation rates were down um the, 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 no one wants to officiate because they don't want to they want to get yelled at no one wants to coach because god if they're not winning every game by a thousand points and trouncing teams then they're not a good coach like it's just such a cultural shift that needs to change eric in your opinion, where do we take the baby steps to start that? Good question. Um, you know, as an, as an individual coach, I think 
there is some responsibility there first. So as me as an individual coach, I have, you know, if I've been asked to coach my kids, you know, soccer team or whatever, that happens all the time. Hey, Bob, you know, you come and uh, join me on the field here. Um, you, you know, it starts with you first. And there's only cer certain things we can do within your control. So it's your responsibility now to ask the right questions of your organization. So just like when you get hired in a job, you have an interview, you ask the appropriate questions. Is this business for me? What is their structure? Um, you know, how, you know, remuneration, all of those things that make up the components to making a decision. Making a decision on coaching, while often it is an afterthought and like, yeah, I guess so. I guess I'll do it because uh, nobody else is doing it. Well, that is important because we want coaches on the side. You say it all the time. A bad volunteer doesn't, being a volunteer doesn't give you the right to suck at what you do. Right. And, um, and so think about asking your organization a couple of key questions, you know, what are your, you know, policies are important. Guidelines are important. What do you stand for? What are your metrics? How am I being evaluated? How are you evaluating each other? How are we evaluating the system of our, of our organization? And so if those organizations that you're potentially volunteering or working for and getting paid to do it, don't have those answers, that's a huge red flag, right? Just like any job you would go to and they're like, oh, I don't quite know that answer. I don't know how much you're getting paid or, oh, we don't do that, right? You would put up a huge red flag and be like, I don't want to work there. So why do we think differently about sport when even if it's a volunteer position, we don't ask those right questions at the beginning? And we should be able to provide people those in our job as well. And again, the outside world holding us accountable as an organization as well is just as important. You can email us and call us anytime you want. You can email us at education at coachesontario.ca and we'll answer you. We'll hear what you're saying and what you're talking about, you know, exit surveys, how you're being recorded. I just, I remember when, you know, when, when I was coaching at various different clubs, you know, how often in our jobs, in your job, do you get a performance review? No kidding. When was the last time that you as a coach, think about it for those listening, you had a performance review on your coaching that didn't involve wins and losses. And then how are they evaluating you? Well, based on what? Based on what one parent sees in the stands? No, that's not appropriate. It's anecdotal evidence. But let the data drive why, you know, why a certain coach deserves to stay, doesn't deserve to stay, you know, should be rewarded with whatever reward or something at the end of the year. So Eric, what I'm hearing sounds like we need more leadership and we need a proper framework to make these changes happen. That's, that's what I took from what you just said, mm -hmm. it, you know, in terms of having a, a better system for coaches and, and sports organizations to, to flourish, let's say. We, we, I don't want to sound like this negative. We've, we've, we haven't been negative, but who's doing this well? What, what coaching do you know? Like, can you give us an example of some stuff that's going well for coaches and what area it might be in or like a region or like, just give us some good stories here. A, a good story where, where some good coaching is happening. Well, actually, I'll give you two examples. So one, I'll give you an example from almost a system perspective, and then I'll give you a personal example. So I actually think the system from a COVID perspective is actually doing a pretty decent job. We've all come out with these fancy guidelines that adhere to the government's rules and keeping kids safe and distancing and, you know, number of kids in a pool on a court wearing masks, no masks. And we're, we're driving home that message and people I think are getting it, at least in my own opinion. Um, and people are getting that. Right. So I on the flip side, to the rest of sport, no pandemic related, well, where is that urgency? Where is that sense of communication or unified communication? You know, where is all of that happening? Like the pandemic is driving us to make quick changes, which is good. Change is not a bad thing. And to adhere and to make sure we're keeping things safe. But when the pandemic wasn't here or when it eventually leaves, right, hopefully, uh, we, you know, what happens then? Do we just revert back to what it was? and every organization talk about different things? No. Personally, uh, you know, I'll say in my first club um, that I coached at, um, which was in Sudbury, and then I coached in Brampton, uh, both clubs actually, we always used to do evaluations on coaches. So um, it was 
but, you know, our, our head coaches would watch us for several days of a month. And then over the course of a, of a term in swimming, there's really two seasons we call long course and short course, just the time of the year. And so we would really sort of sit down, um, scheduled sit down about twice a year. You're always, you know, sitting down together informally, but scheduled twice a year. Personally, for me, what I would do in my own coaching practice, and people can think about this in their own is, okay, so how do I then evaluate my success to my athletes? So one, I used to survey all of my athletes. I don't care if they were eight or they were 15. I used to survey them all. Uh, through their parents, of course, because that's important. And, but I used to get their feedback. Yes, eight-year-olds, you know, they're not the best with words, but guess what? Eight-year-olds, you know, young kids don't lie. They tell you straight up how things are, right? They're like, I don't like that. And then that's great. You can make those changes. And so I used to collect quantitative and qualitative feedback from them over the course of the year. And then in swimming myself, I used to find um, technical aspects of the sport that I could measure quantifiable that were not related to wins and losses, that were related to the development of an athlete. And so in swimming, for example, um, we used to measure how fast they could kick underwater for 25 meters or 15 meters because it was important to the start. And so just like track, you've got that little short burst there. And we used to measure that. Every month we used to do a game, a big game amongst everybody, and we would have all their stats for the last month. And I'm measuring their success against my success because if that skill is being developed, the skill is kicking underwater. That's the skill. I don't care whether or not you do it in 10 seconds or 25 seconds. But at the end of the year, did you go from 25 to 20? Great. You just, you know, you had astronomical performance. And that's what I used to also share with parents. Every couple of months, they're always asking, you know, parents are important. And they're always asking, you know, how's Johnny or how's Lucy doing, right? Well, here's some of the data we have, right? These are the skills that the sport is teaching and we're measuring. It will eventually translate into success on the scoreboard, but that's not important. And these other components. And so when I, you know, if I have my one word of advice for coaches out there is, when you're standing on your field, your court, your pool, wherever you are, think about the skill acquisition and can you measure those skills? Because kids need to see feedback, right? They don't want just verbal feedback. They want you know, quantifiable feedback to show that they're getting better. And the bright eyes that kids used to get after six months and you show them on a board, you started here and now you're here. Six months later, they're like, wow, I did that. You're like, yeah, you did. And, you know, you're developing those skills, you're becoming a faster swimmer, but they're having fun while doing it. It's such a good point. And Daryl and I talk about this all the time, Eric, and kudos to you because we always talk about when we hear the words athlete development, where there's been no baseline or mid-season follow, ideally baseline, mid-season, end of the season, three times. And you'll hear coaches, well, I don't want to give up a practice for that. Okay, but so then what are you doing? Like the, then, then how are you reporting the development of those athletes? So we, we totally agree with you. And it's, it makes the coach's job so much easier because you're getting kids that have been off all summer. They start with the baseline just by playing their sport. They're probably going to improve mid season. And then from the mid season to the, the end of the season, that's really the, the, the coach's push. So it, it just, it, it is nothing but in your benefit to do that. So it's such a great example. I do, however, want to circle back to the example that you gave, you know, about the, about the, how, how we've come together during COVID. <clears throat> and I think it's the underlying reason it's, and it's similar to me and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, concussion, concussion done well in Ontario. It's actually not done well in other, other regions. And why? Because it's been legislated. So Correct. there's there's accountability and there's liability with that. Return to play in COVID has been done well because there is fear and there is consequences and liability attached to that. So now everyone's paying attention. So the minute you know that you could be could be held responsible for a player's well-being in COVID or a player's well-being in concussion, well now all of a sudden you're taking the course and everyone's taking the course and it's legislated and it's law. Why don't we do the same thing for all of coaching? Why do we leave off all of those other components and only deal with the bad stuff, the doom and gloom, um, you know, the liabilities, the, the, the abuse reporting? And don't get me wrong, that's super important and we need to do it, but why don't we do it for the entirety of the breadth of quality coaching? And it's a rhetorical question because I know we've talked about it. Um, because the answer is because it's not 
it's not, there's no mandate for it. It's not, well, do I need to do it? Well, is it legal? Well, and just like you said, you can't do X if you haven't done Y. Until we get to that point, sport will stay the same. It will continue to be everybody's version of what it should be and how it should be coached and how it should be delivered and what should be measured. And it will continue to spiral down because it's not consumer centric. Yep. I agreed. Right. And I think one of the other things you mentioned is, you know, it, it's like, you know, it's when the dollars go, when liability and risk goes, everybody jumps. Well, one of the things I think we always forget is I think what's more important than all of that. And I know we all anecdotally know this is the impact that you're making on that child's life. We have seen so many instances where a bad sport experience is very bad for a kid and an athlete and what that means for the rest of their life. And how do you as an organization out there, whether you're small or big, national, local, whatever you are, how do you sleep at night knowing that the impact you're making on kids is, you know, sometimes half ass and, you know, what else are you doing to, you know, you're, you're having this big impact on kids, but we don't see it in the same way as the liability piece where, oh, great, I could be sued for this or it's going to cost us millions of dollars. But if a kid has a bad experience, it's not my problem or I don't care. Well, you, that's actually worse than the liability piece because money just money comes and goes. Right. Money is money. And this in, this kid, they're going to have that experience for the rest of their life. Absolutely. So well said. Okay, Eric. So we've taken up enough of your time. We're going to go on to first steps next. Um, Daryl always usually takes us over and asks you for first steps, and then I go, and then he doesn't get it. So today we're going to mix it up. We're going to go, we're going to go Daryl first. Coach D is going to give his first steps based on this conversation. And then Eric, your first steps. It can be one to three things. You don't need to make stuff up. Just whatever comes to top of mind how to create these quality sport experiences as a coach under your lens, something to think about. Daryl, based on our conversation, first steps, go. Well, I, you know what? I, I like what uh, Eric said today about these stakeholders. If you're a stakeholder out there, a parent, a coach, uh, a, a player, you have to ask better questions. And if, if you want real change, you have to ask, well, you know, why is this happening this way? How are we getting evaluated? All those questions you have to ask. If you don't ask, it's on you. You, you, you get what you get and, and you're going to keep getting what you get. So that would be probably, you know, I'm just going to give one that that's the, the biggest thing I want the audience to take away today. See, awesome. I see them for everybody. <laughs> Eric, first steps. Uh, I've got three. So it, they're really simple. First one, he talked about asking the right questions. We mentioned it before, but as you as a coach, when you're stepping in, your responsibility to ask the right questions of the organization and even those above you, ask the right questions of, you know, what are your policies? What are your guidelines? What do you believe in? Show me the data. How am I being measured? Ask those questions because it's on you. Second thing is get data. So when you're actually in there, do surveys, exit surveys, entrance surveys. Why is this kid joining this program, right? Not because they're bored, but why are they actually here? And fun fact, everybody knows this, but if you look at the list of why kids participate in sport, winning is actually number 48 of 81 on the list. It's not even in the top 47. So Think about that. And then the third thing is, is now that you've done all those things, be a role model in your own sport organization and to those in your own local community. Measure those athlete development metrics, things that show athlete growth, that you're doing those surveys and that you've asked those questions. So in the future, you can come on a podcast and then ask, say those same things and share your own experiences. Absolutely. Love it. Uh, first steps for me would be not to not to reiterate what you guys have said. Uh, you know, my first steps would be at an organizational level for whoever's listening in the Canadian sports system. It's time we have some leadership. We need to we need to have a, a minister of sport. That minister of sport needs to have some power and leverage so that some of these things can be legislated so that sport is actually um, adjudicated properly, for lack of better words, so that we're actually doing it properly. We've got so much talent. So much expertise in Canada. Uh, there's so many pockets of people doing such good things. Eric, as you said, we're all in our silos. That takes leadership to bring everyone out of their silos to the table and say, we are going to create a framework 
That is going to be the foundation for our sport building. And you have this opportunity. We want this from you. We want this from you. And we're going to start walking our talk because everything that we tell our athletes in sport is communicate, be together, think team, uh, all of those things, but we don't do it in our administration and in our sport hierarchy. So my first step would be somebody from Canada that has the political will, clout and expertise and leadership skills must step up to the table, uh, whether that's Adam Vancouverton, whether that is somebody else in our system and say, we need to bring the right people to the table. And those right people may not be all the same familiarity bias that we always hear from. Could be some of those people, um, but those right people need to be behavior change specialists. They need to be marketing and communications experts. They need to be the representatives from marginalized populations. They need to be a reflection of the people that we serve and they need to have business experience. That's my first step. Daryl? Great points, Matt. So, you know, let's wrap this up. Eric, thank you for being on the show today, my man. Awesome points, awesome information. Uh, anyone listening today, I'm sure they're going to get a lot of good information. Matt, that was a great wrap up there. Uh, if you like this podcast, please share this with your friends, family, anyone who you think needs to hear this. We need people that we need, we really need people to understand what's going on and what we need for real change in new sports coaching. This is going to end up with a quality sports experience. So on that note, Eric, thanks again. Just go play guys. Just go play.